So to call yourself a cessationist is uh, easily to be misunderstood. It suggests that the Spirit has ceased to work in the church, and nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you for tuning in to episode 130 of Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss Reformed theology and cultural issues, all from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchborg, Director of Marketing here at Mid-America. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, Dr. Cornelis Venema and Dr. Marcus Minninger continue their case for the cessation of revelatory gifts, uh, that is, speaking in tongues, prophecy, miraculous healings, by addressing this very question, if the revelatory gifts have ceased, how do we respond to fellow believers who claim to have these gifts or have experienced speaking in tongues and miraculous signs? If cessationism is true, how do we, uh, as those who hold to Reformed convictions, not come across as if we're somehow diminishing the work of the Spirit today. Here's Dr. Marcus Minninger to get us started. In comparison to what we said previously in prior episodes, a question comes up about uh, tongues in particular. Um, we talked more about um, prophecy in in previous episode and some other related things, uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in general in Acts. But what about tongues? And I, I think that we need to remember a few things. Uh, first of all is that First Corinthians 14 seems to connect prophecy and tongues in their function, at least in as much as when tongues are interpreted. And in fact, Paul urges that in the Corinthian church, tongues not be spoken without interpretation. And then he also says, uh, because because the tongues aren't useful without interpretation, they don't build up or edify. Uh, but he also says that he would rather speak a prophecy in a known tongue than have a, a tongue spoken, in other words, uh, something that's otherwise unintelligible to the speaker and the listener um, in its place. Point being here that uh, we would believe that as Scripture represents it, uh, the speaking of, of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, for example, is when interpreted tantamount to prophecy. Its purpose was the same, the to edify and build up the congregation by proclaiming to them the truth, which came in these two discrete ways, uh, related ways, prophecy in general or tongues interpreted. And so both of them are then a part of this revelatory activity, uh, the word of God being spoken in the Christian community through the spirit of God and to be received uh, authoritatively if it is in fact from the spirit of God. Now, the question of why are they meant to be discerning and evaluating and testing these uh, spoken words? Well, that I think applies to any proposed new revelation in the early church, the Apostle John would say, beloved, test the spirits to see whether they're from God, right? Uh, because not every spirit that comes and and speaks a word or somebody who speaks through a spirit is necessarily speaking from the spirit of God. There are other spirits, demons, etc., who could propose a prophecy in someone's mind, a tongue, etc., that wasn't actually from God. So there was a need in the earliest church when they heard uh, spoken testimony proposing itself to be from God for there to be evaluation and testing uh, by the Spirit's enabling to, to uh, confirm, is this indeed a message from God or is it from someone else? But that would apply to uh, anyone speaking. That's not exclusive to tongues alone, but somebody speaking in their, in, in not in a tongue, but in their own words, so to speak, their own language, known language would also undergo scrutiny to be sure that what was spoken was in fact true, uh, truly revelatory. So we would take it to be the case that both tongues, uh, when interpreted, which they were supposed to be, uh, and prophecy function in the same way. They're both revelatory word from God, and that's part of why they are both part of the foundation-laying process done once for all in the church 
uh, of the apostolic period and then both uh, cease in the church once that revelatory foundation laying process is over. Uh, the question then also comes up about miracles, just to tie some of these loose ends together. Um, the, the scriptures would uh, take miracles particularly to be attestations of revelatory authority. They authenticate that a prophet or even Jesus himself when he was on earth was in fact speaking from God. The miracle attests to the truth value of the spoken word, the revelatory spoken word. So you look at Mark 2, for example, when Jesus declares the sins of the paralytic uh, to be forgiven and then he verifies the authenticity, the truth value of his proclaiming sins forgiven by healing the man, the, raising the paralytic up, right? In order that you might know, he says. And so then he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. So the miracles would be tied into this whole revelatory activity uh, foundation laying for the church. So all told then, you would see that the apostleship itself, as well as prophecy and tongues and miracle working, would be things given to the church during this uh, distinct foundation laying period. We can think too, you know, when we start to begin to think about practical questions, uh, the the church in this time period, the Corinthians, uh, did not have the New Testament. They did not have the, the, the vast majority, most likely, many, let's just say, to not get into too many chronological questions, certainly many of the books of the New Testament did not yet exist for them. Yet God uses these revelatory gifts in their midst to guide his church uh, along the way in this time period in which they don't have the full written word. Um, And we'll talk, I'm sure, in a bit more later about how we're really in the much more privileged position of having the fixed, abiding, written testimony of the apostles and others in the pages of the New Testament, which makes our need for these other things also cease in the way that it existed then. Another question that comes up on kind of shifting into some practical uh, issues of the present day would be, uh, what do we think when we hear claims about uh, a revelatory word spoken, a, 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 you know, people practicing tongues, for example, or when we hear claims about miracles, you know, what do we make of that? I think a couple things I would want to say would be, uh, first of all, can God do miracles? Uh, absolutely. Uh, do, do we pray for miraculous healing uh, when we have a loved one who's sick, etc.? Certainly, I, I hope we do, and I hope we pray with faith and confidence that God can do that, and that I think he sometimes does do that. Do I know that he did in a particular instance when you hear about a claim of somebody in some other country or whatever it might be? Well, a lot of times I don't know enough to know one way or the other. And to be honest, I don't feel that I need to know one way or the other. I think one of the issues that comes up here in particular is where should our focus be as Christians? And what is the Lord particularly providing to sustain and encourage us? What would at least be different today is that we do not have people uh, walking around who are miracle workers, meaning that they're given an abiding gift or office from the Holy Spirit to continuously and regularly work miracles, right? So God may, in fact, produce a miracle for us at some point, healing someone or or the like, right? Um, But if he has, I give glory and thanks to him, if he's actually used secondary causes to bring about someone's healing instead and whether I know that or not, I still give glory to him. Now, where am I to go from there? To continue before him through his word and spirit to use all that he's provided to his church corporately and the gifts that are still operative in our midst uh, to serve him and glorify him. And uh, whether or not he would work another miracle the next time someone's sick or not, right? In other words, the, the issue somewhat becomes... Uh, what is the ordinary course of things? What are we to expect? I don't think we have a, a promise that we ought to expect God in the ordinary course of things to always be working miracles, although he may. It's his up to his uh, choosing. And then along with that, with, with the tongues, I think we have to ask the question, wherein is the authoritative word of God? And that's where a lot of the ambiguity and confusion often comes from. People want to advocate for a kind of tongues that's not infallible, that's uh, uh, at some sort of lower level, Uh, well, if that's the case, then couldn't we agree, shouldn't we agree that what we will focus on as a church, we can at least agree to this, 
what we will seek to most concern ourselves with is the infallible, abiding, authoritative, written down word of God from the apostles themselves and the others who were companions in that time period. One of the the real, I think, sad states of affairs in Pentecostally, charismatically oriented churches is the predominant neglect of the written word of God, scripture itself. We become preoccupied with, let's say, if there were an exceptional event, let's just put it there as in if it were ever the case, right? Still, where ought our focus to be? Should it not clearly be upon God's abiding written word given to us in the pages of the New Testament from the apostles and prophets? That should be something that we should be able to seek unity around, even with our charismatic brothers and sisters. Yeah, if I may uh, follow up on that, in terms of my earlier in our first podcast, description of various waves, I think we can be encouraged that from the first to the second and then the third wave, the kind of claims that were made by earlier representations of Pentecostalism have been significantly reduced. And much of what we've been saying about the primacy of the inscripturated word, testimony of the apostles and prophets of the New Testament economy that we have in the New Testament is the canon norm that regulates, founds, and directs the faith and practice and ministry of the church today. And whatever claims are made, even within the third wave, the so-called cautious but still continuing affirmation of a gift like prophecy or even speaking in tongues, there's a much greater readiness to acknowledge that it's fallible at best. It may be a, a leading of the Spirit, but anything that is said requires being tested by the primary and highest standard, which is what God has made known to us in his word. So so to go back in the way to the the question of how do we respond to claims that are made regarding the ongoing presence, continuation of these gifts, you, f- you first of all has to ask, well, what's being affirmed? I've already indicated that I think it's very destructive to suggest that a good portion of the New Covenant Church of our Lord Jesus Christ have not enjoyed this baptism by the Spirit and therefore are not living out of the fullness of the Spirit's presence, but in some lower level state of Christian experience. That's pastorally destructive. It it leads to fracturing and division in the local church uh, and among uh, between and among churches, and it's contrary to Scripture. Uh, the same thing holds true for um, the claims made about speaking with tongues. In many cases today, in the cautious affirmation of ongoing tongue speakings, it's usually associated with what's called the prayer tongue. Now, whether that fits the profile of the gift of speaking in tongues it's, as it's set forth in the New Testament is another question. It doesn't seem that Paul is allowing for a prayer tongue in distinction from the prophecy given in the assembly uh, in the way of tongue speaking when interpreted. Um, they're closely linked Um, But the problem with the tendency to make appeals to a diversity of ongoing ways whereby through word gifts like prophecy and tongue speaking, God's uh, word or will is communicated in some fashion to us, is it diminishes our confession that the scriptures are not only God-breathed, canonical, they're sufficient for the faith and practice of the church, there's inevitably a kind of creation of a secondary canon, a new norm, and then attached to that, tethered to that, comes something like a richer experience of God's presence and his working. I'd like to turn to a a broadly more positive statement on this question. When you take a position and it's denominated cessationist, you're already in a defensive posture. And I go back to where we began and with a comment Marcus made in our earlier podcast that Reformed churches, Presbyterian churches, churches in the line of the Reformation always want 
and insist that the Spirit gathers, defends, and preserves the church throughout history by the working of his Spirit with the Word, by his Spirit and Word. And the Word there is the Word as it's been given to the whole church. So we don't deny the ongoing presence and working of the Holy Spirit, not only through those ecclesiastical offices we call the ministry of the Word, of pastors and teachers, the language Paul uses in Ephesians 4. He uses that language as well in uh, Romans 12, uh, about those who are gifted to minister the Word of God. So he says to Timothy when he's instructing Timothy in the care and keeping of the church that he should entrust to faithful men the things that he's heard from the Apostle Paul. And they would then in turn teach others. And so we have a, an understanding not only of the ecclesiastical offices, the three offices of ministers of the word, pastors, teachers, elders, governors, administrators, and as well deacons, but there's the office of believer. All believers are in union with Christ by the Spirit, uh, entrusted with and by the Spirit, exercising a threefold office as prophets, priests, and kings. Now, their prophetic office is not creating a new word or hearing a new word uh, to supplement or to enrich what God has given to us in his word, but it's to bear testimony to the word that we've heard, to witness to that which has been witnessed to us, uh, to be those who teach, speak, bear witness in accordance with God, with what God has given us to know in his word. Uh, they have a priestly ministry. We haven't used this language, but I think uh, Richard Gaffin makes a good point in his fine book, Perspectives on Pentecost, referencing 1 Peter 4.11, that there are broadly speaking two kinds of gifts, gifts whereby the Spirit empowers us to minister the Word in teaching, proclaiming, uh, speaking in Christ's name, the Word of the Gospel, and gifts of service whereby we perform deeds, whether it be the work of administration, diaconal labor, a whole diversity of ways in which members of the church in their threefold office are empowered by the Spirit distinctly, but generally and freely by the Spirit's working with the wherewithal to minister the Word and to serve one another. And perhaps we have a vulnerability as Reformed Christians in that we have not lived up to our confession. We sort of fall always into one of two errors. We either become guilty of clericalism that diminishes the office of believer, or we become uh, unduly democratic and unwilling to acknowledge that the Spirit's presence in the church uh, given by Christ is marked by precisely those gifts we call, but that's the language Paul uses in Ephesians 5, the ascended Lord has given gifts. And he's given apostles, prophets, whose ministry laying of the foundation has concluded. But then, as well, teachers, pastors, and teachers who, building upon that foundation, minister the word that has been given and entrusted to the church from one generation to the next. So to call yourself a cessationist is uh, easily to be misunderstood, it suggests that the Spirit has ceased to work in the church, and nothing could be further from the truth. Paul has a, a beautiful expression of that in the opening section of his um, treatment of the question in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, and he sort of lays down what you might call broad principles respecting the work of the Spirit in gifting the church for ministry. And he's very insistent that the whole body and all of her members need each other, and each plays a role and is by the Spirit gifted for one or another form of service, either in ministering the Word or in serving the needs of others. And that's an emphasis that we need. But it's not for some, it's for all. And maybe I should mention just one other passage significant in this connection is Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. And if you read that passage in context, the way that comes to expression is in worship, in praise, in growing in wisdom, in being subject to each other, in our respective vocations and callings. Um, that's not something by way of an exhortation to some Christians, 
It's a present tense imperative calling all Christians to uh, be continuously drawing upon and empowered by the Spirit as they grow together in the service of the Lord. I think that um, if you step back and look at the Pentecostal charismatic movements, a lot of times what they're trying to deal with is a perhaps uh, a sense of dullness or lack of zeal, emptiness of personal Christian experience. And I think in some ways the, the big picture of what we're trying to say is that the solution to that isn't by having some additional different new thing as a part of our experience that not all Christians have had um, or were meant to have, meaning tongues, prophecy, miracles, that sort of thing, these extraordinary things as they might be thought of, right? But rather a greater appreciation of the of the momentous, wonderful, life-giving nature of what we've already been given corporately and in a once-for-all way through the ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the apostles and prophets whom he commissioned and uh, caused to write in the New Testament, right? In other words, that these things are of great moment and climax as the eschatological fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, right? In other words, we need to have a higher view of what we all together corporately have as one and a more faithful use of those things. That's where the fullness lies that maybe perhaps we we feel at times that we lack in or we observe others lacking in, right? The solution, again, to have a biblically high view of what's already been accomplished and provided, a momentous view, an excited view, honestly, if you if you look at what's what, you know, Christ has ascended and is reigning and ruling and has poured out all these things, which give this once for all result that we've talked about through the apostles and prophets, and then a continuing operation of other gifts among all of us, right? And and this is amazing. And there is a fullness there, a richness. So a high appreciation of those things, and then seeking to have a faithful, zealous use of those things. That's where I think um, we can all agree that to focus and to be grateful and to experience what it is the Lord has for us. If you've struggled with this subject matter or know someone who does, I hope this series on cessationism versus continuationism has been helpful for you. Special revelation has ceased to continue. The revelatory gifts are not normative for God's people. But as we've heard uh, in these last few episodes, the Spirit is most certainly at work in the church, building her up by the proclamation of the Word. Some are called to a special vocation to proclaim this Word, that is, uh, the minister of the Word and sacraments, and in this vocation they hold an office. Next week, Dr. Alan Strange takes us on a tour of this office, as well as the offices of elder and deacon in the weeks ahead. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.